The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own, and The Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Yeah! From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Ruff Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Ross Belleville. Welcome back, everybody. It is Tuesday, October 2nd, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome, tokers and tokets and lovers and liberty to the Russ Belleville Show. We're so glad to have you here. All sorts of great stuff to get to. Before we get to it, let's introduce everyone we got in the studio hanging out here in seat number two. We got Brian the Red. How you doing, Brian? Hey, 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 everybody. Hey, Brian's got some stuff for us in hour two about the world's oldest stash. Oh, yeah, man. It's uh, an older story. Pardon the pun. Uh, but uh, yeah, 2,700 year old stash from the Gobi Desert. That's gonna, pretty cool. Get you an update on that. Yeah, we'll check that out. Also, we got uh, Wiz Coleco hanging out here doing some work, as he always is. Hello, huh? Yeah, I'm just uh, hanging out, using this place as a work studio. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you very you're much. very, very welcome. And I uh, want to remind everyone to support Oregonians for law reform. Check out OregonLawReform.com. Help us pass legalization here in uh, the state of Oregon. Now, uh, we'd also normally introduce Cannabis Carrie at this point. She has got the week off this week, recovering from our travels to Boise and she'll be coming with me and Coleco and Sam Chapman. We're going to make our way down to Los Angeles for the normal national conference starting on Thursday. So there will be a live show tomorrow, but no live shows on Thursday and Friday. We will try to bring you some stream stuff or some video stuff up on our blog at RadicalRust.com. So stay tuned for that stuff. All right, for today's show, all sorts of great stuff. We got our uh, 420 headline news uh, coming up next. And in the headlines today, Washington State has pulled in more money for marijuana legalization. We'll give you the totals in the headlines. Also from Washington State, we've got two county sheriffs, uh, two county sheriff's candidates debating each other on marijuana legalization. You'll be amazed what they have to say about it. Then we take a look at Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is ending arrests for adult marijuana possession of small personal quantities as of today. And a look at the state of Connecticut and their medical marijuana program, which went online yesterday, but some of the problems they are still continuing to have. Then we go behind the headlines we're going to split it up a little bit we've got a stupid prohibition story coming out of vermont and then we're going to also uh take a look at the michigan medical marijuana act and how they're scrutinizing the doctors who recommend marijuana for their patients we got your daily toker tunes for electric tuesday featuring julia child remixed we're going to have some good cooking music coming up at half past the hour across the pond clark french and greg deho from normal uk will be joining us from england and we got a radical rant at the end of the show why why do we keep trying to separate the healthy from the sick when it comes to marijuana use? All that and more coming up on today's Russ Belville Show. Please stick around. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Honey, our ballots came in the mail today. I can't wait to cast my vote for Measure 80. Measure 80? Is that the one to legalize marijuana? I don't know about that. Why not? Marijuana is far safer than alcohol. 
I know that, but I worry about kids smoking pot. It's easier for kids to buy pot than beer because clerks check for proper ID. Sure, but what about stone drivers? We've had medical marijuana for 14 years, and yet our traffic safety stats are better now than before medical marijuana. Okay, but what about people coming in stone to work? Come on now, honey. Oregon's workplaces are safer than ever, and we have over 50,000 medical marijuana patients. Nothing about Measure 80 prevents employers from maintaining drug-free workplaces. I know change is scary, but Oregon really needs jobs and tax revenue, and Measure 80 will provide them. Okay, safer for kids and tax revenue for our state? Makes sense to me. I'm voting yes on Measure 80. Paid for by Oregonians for Law Reform, OregonLawReform.com. Warning, hits taken on this show are larger than they appear. Do not try this at home. These people are professionals. <laughs> or at least they pay me to say We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana and, and the, the next thing you know they got 10 years, they've got mandatory sentences and these judges just say they throw up their hands and say nothing we can do is mandatory sentences. We've got to take a look at what we're considering crimes. When the Reverend Pat Robertson from television's The 700 Club criminalizing marijuana, criminalizing uh, the possession of a few ounces of, of uh, pot and that kind of thing, I mean it's just... Makes more sense on the marijuana issue than the president the Congress and the Supreme Court. It's costing us a fortune and it's ruining young people. The young people go into prisons, they come out, they go in as, as uh, youths and they come out as hardened criminals and it's not a good thing. You know we're winning. Now it's time for your 420 headline news with Carrie Gallagher. She is off this week. I'm Russ Belleville with the news. Washington State's I-502 racks up another $1 million in donations. Washington State's proposal to legalize possession of an ounce of marijuana and create a system of state-regulated cultivation and distribution, I-502, has picked up another $1 million in donations, totaling now over $4 million raised from supporters of legalization around the country. Allison Holcomb, the campaign director for I-502, says the new donations will help them air a new TV ad in the state in the week before the election. Donations included another $670,000 from Peter Lewis, the billionaire philanthropist known for his support of drug policy reform, which has brought his total to over $1.5 million. Drug Policy Action, the political action committee arm of Drug Policy Alliance, has donated $715,000, and River Sticks Foundation's James and Cody Swift have donated $420,000. The only registered opposition to I-502 comes from medical marijuana providers and patients organized by longtime activist and marijuana grower Steve Sarich. That group has raised $5,760 to date. Washington's I-502 is clearly well-funded and may be the best-funded marijuana legalization campaign ever. Colorado's Amendment 64 is also doing well with over $1 million in donations from some deep-pocket donors. Oregon's Measure 80 stands in stark contrast with the official campaign running deficits, according to the latest campaign funding information. An independent PAC, Oregonians for Law Reform, has emerged to assist in fundraising for the Measure 80 campaign in Oregon. Washington and Colorado are doing fine. If you're a national supporter of legalization, please send your donations to OregonLawReform.com today. In other news from Washington, King County Sheriff's candidates squabble over who supports marijuana legalization more. When any sort of marijuana liberalization proposal makes it to the ballot, you can always count on law enforcement to pipe up in strong opposition to it, whether it be lowest law enforcement priority, decriminalization, medicalization, or legalization. On a rare occasion, you may get a law enforcement voice in support, but usually they are retired officers from law enforcement against prohibition. Never in all our reporting on marijuana legalization have we ever witnessed the situation Dominic Holden reports from Seattle, where the sitting King County Sheriff Steve Strachan, a former D.A.R.E. officer, and his opponent, John Urquhart, a law enforcement vet with over two decades of two dozen years of experience, not only voiced their support for Washington's I-502 legalization initiative, but fought over which one of them wanted to legalize marijuana more. Said Strachan, quote, as the sheriff, I don't think it is a problem for public safety if we legalize it because that will provide a supported, understood law that we can enforce. 
Uh, the lack of clarity in the current medical marijuana law, he continued, is bad for criminal justice, bad for the rule of law, and bad for kids. As a law enforcement leader, he concluded, I think legalization will lead to the greatest clarity. I will vote for I-502. But Urquhart said that his said that, that position contains no leadership and it's not enough. Quote, Strachan talked about clarifying the law, he said of his opponent. The reason I am for legalization is not to clarify the law. I am saying that morally... It should be legal. When sitting sheriffs are parroting our talking points about D.A.R.E., you know the end is near. Sheriff Strachan refused to back down, saying that when he was a D.A.R.E. officer, quote, he was overblowing the dangers of pot, that marijuana use was a personal responsibility, and that mixing messages about marijuana with other truly dangerous drugs was incredibly unhelpful. Kalamazoo, Michigan makes marijuana position, possession a ticket, not an arrest. The city of Kalamazoo has an, adopted an ordinance that will allow marijuana possession to be treated as a ticket to appear on court, in court on misdemeanor charges rather than an arrest. Last November, the city had passed an ordinance making enforcement of marijuana possession the lowest enforcement priority. Monday's ordinance also reduces the maximum possible penalty for the marijuana misdemeanor. Prior to this week, marijuana possession in Kalamazoo was prosecuted under state law, which has the potential of one year in prison and a $2,000 fine. Now, marijuana possession can be prosecuted under the the new city ordinance, which allows for a maximum of 93 days in jail and a $100 fine. Car Carrie Ann Thomas, an assistant chief from KDPS, said, quote, it just helps us free up our officers, saying there'll be more time for evidence technicians and lab workers as well. That's your 420 headline news for today, Tuesday, October 2nd, 2012. I'm Russ Belleville. When we come back, we have a stupid prohibition story from Vermont, and we go behind the headlines on the Connecticut Medical Marijuana Program. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're not looking to end beer summits at the White House or change the way people behave on the campaign trail. We just believe adults, in the privacy of their homes, should be allowed to use marijuana instead of alcohol if that's what they prefer. Forty years ago, our government launched an irrational war on marijuana for reasons unrelated to the actual and limited harms of the substance. It's time for a more sensible approach. It's time to regulate marijuana. Paid for by the campaign to regulate marijuana like... I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high, uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. I don't know what this says about the online audience, but <laughs> uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So. Nearly one million lives wrecked by a marijuana arrest every year, Mr. President. Politely tell President Obama what you think about legalization by calling the White House at 202-456-1111. As a public service, the Russ Belleville Show reminds you that smoking marijuana does not make one stupid. However, some stupid people do smoke marijuana, and Prohibition is always waiting for another victim. Learn your lesson from today's stupid Prohibition stories. I'm your old-timey 1920s radio reporter, Freddie Farrock, with your stupid Prohibition story. A Vermont man got smoked when he allegedly decided to light up after getting a summons for marijuana possession. Williston police say Hassan Ali was arrested, cited, and released on Saturday when they found him and two other people with weed in an apartment building, WPTZ reports. But it wouldn't be the last time he'd be in handcuffs that night. The investigation began with Tara Lynn Hopper, age 21, who cops were looking for in connection to a $28,000 jewelry theft and a felony warrant. 
Officers went to her apartment and collared her, issued a citation to Ali, and left a third woman in the apartment alone. But back at the police station, cop re cops realized the third woman, Amanda Bevins, age 20, also had a warrant out for her arrest, according to the Associated Press. When the cops returned to arrest Bevins, they found that Ali had allegedly bought more marijuana during the hour they were gone. Joshua Moore of the Williston Police told WPTZ, quote, They were able to identify the smell of marijuana that led yet again to another investigation, end quote. Ali was arrested again and taken to jail, according to Yahoo News. Bevins was also arrested. In court this week, Ali pleaded not guilty to charges of marijuana possession. I'm Freddie Farrakh, your old-timey 1920 radios reporter, with your stupid prohibition stories. Oh, thank you so much, Freddie, for uh, that report. Guy gets busted twice for weed in one hour. Amazing. Although it does remind me of a friend of mine back from high school who got uh, busted for driving on a suspended license. And so he drove his car to court, went to court on the suspended license ticket, got out of court and drove away. And as he's driving away, the cop that testified against him just in court a few minutes ago sees him driving away, pulls him back over, hauls him back in front of the cop who he had just seen for driving on the suspended license for driving on the suspended license. <laughs> so uh, it's not unheard of. Uh, my, uh, my condolences to the Hassi Ala, uh, Hassan Ali family who will be missing him while he's serving his time for the possession. Uh, I also want to take some time here in the show to go behind the scenes, uh, behind the headlines here in one of our stories uh, from earlier, and that is on the state of Connecticut. Um, Connecticut passed its medical marijuana law, and officially on October 1st, yesterday, it went into uh, effect. So now Connecticut's one of the 17 United States, that's one third, by the way, of the United States, that will no longer prosecute patients who are using marijuana for medical purposes in accordance with their physician's recommendation. If they can find any medical marijuana, that is. The commissioner of the State Department that will institute the dispensary system that was approved under the law says that the earliest any patient will be able to access medical marijuana legally won't be, quote, until sometime next year, end quote. And, of course, as is becoming the East Coast medical marijuana trend, patients are not allowed to grow their own marijuana. What's the holdup? Why, the protocols and procedures that are necessary to ensure no healthy people end up smoking Connecticut medical marijuana. William Rubenstein, the commissioner of the State Department of Consumer Protection, said, quote, it's an enormously complicated task, end quote. Yes, you heard me right. The Department of Consumer Protection, not the Department of Public Health, runs the medical marijuana program in Connecticut. I mean, at least that's better than Hawaii's medical marijuana program, which is run by the Narcotics Enforcement Division of the state police. Because when it comes to the medical use of marijuana, that's something consumers need to be protected from, regardless of how it affects public health. I don't get it. But uh, reading from a story uh, from Connecticut, they say, uh, again, quoting this uh, William Rubenstein from Department of Consumer Protection, quote, the law, law was signed May 31st and we're still doing our due diligence to make sure we have a system to supply a safe product that's free from theft and diversion and abuse, end quote. In setting up the system for Connecticut, he said the department is taking lessons from the other states with medical marijuana laws about what works and what doesn't. Quote, no one wants us to be like California, end quote. He said, referring to what many consider a poorly regulated distribution system there that makes the drug too easily available and subject to abuse. Hmm. Well, I hope the people suffering in Connecticut realize that the wait of three months or maybe more exists solely because of the prohibition of marijuana for healthy people. The tragic irony is that the healthy people smoking marijuana in Connecticut are not going to be impacted by this one bit. <laughs> uh, so timid on these dispensaries. First of all, you got to understand, in Connecticut, their list of conditions includes cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, damage to the nervous tissue of the spinal cord with objective neurological indication of intractable spasticity. It's a mouthful. Epilepsy, cachexia, wasting syndrome, Crohn's disease, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Notice that severe pain, chronic pain, and intractable pain are not listed because Connecticut took a lesson from the other states with medical marijuana and decided that all their pain patients were just healthy people who were faking it, I suppose. 
This despite the fact that we have more objective, double-blind, placebo-controlled, gold standard studies verifying the analgesic properties of cannabis than we have evidence of relief for any of those other conditions that are listed in the Connecticut law. And not only that, to be able to get medical marijuana in, in Connecticut, the physician has to register the patient. The physician has to go online and register that this particular patient might qualify. After the physician registers the patient, then the patient has to get into that registry and fill in the rest of it. And then if the physician decides it's okay, the patient can have a caregiver. But that's up to the physician's dis d discretion. And finally, the dispensaries themselves, there's only going to be three to 10 of them in the entire state, and only a licensed pharmacist can run one which makes me wonder how the DEA is going to like letting them have their controlled substances licenses to prescribe other medications while they are running a shop that has Schedule 1 medications in them completely against their federal licensing. I'd like to see how that's going to turn out. Meanwhile, the other 202,000 marijuana smokers in Connecticut who aren't medical marijuana uh, patients, they're going to continue to buy on the black market, and uh, none of this dispensary stuff is going to hurt them whatsoever. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Speaking of uh, marijuana dispensing, yeah. I think it's uh, time for a break. Yeah, uh, that music, that's, you know, like the old school bell. You know, it means that you have to do something. It's mandatory. So <laughs> We're on uh, it. We're on it. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you talking to that reefer man. Funky Roller Rink. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's happening, Groovy Cats? This is your Funk Master of Ceremonies Big Daddy. And I want you to join me every Thursday night at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, right here at the Funky Roller Rink. Oh, yeah. Your home of soul, funk, and disco, baby. Funky It's always a party at the Funky Roller Ring. The Russ Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive in Terry. Hang out for a while and share. You're tuned into the Rush Belleville Show. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Rush Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Electric Tuesday, featuring the latest in electronic dance music and other cutting-edge genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our daily Tucker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily Tucker tune. For Tuesdays, we like to do our Electric Tuesday music uh, remixes, and, and lately we've been featuring a lot of uh, auto-tune remixes from a producer named Melody Sheep. Uh, you can find him out on YouTube, just Melody Sheep. And uh, he did all of the Symphony of Science remixes. I think there's 15 or 16 of them now, and we've played uh, all of them here on the show. We love them. He's lately started tackling some PBS remixes. Apparently, PBS found the guy. He's doing work now for PBS Digital Studios. And uh, we've played a couple of these as well. We played the Mr. Rogers remix, and we played a Bob Ross remix, uh, the Happy Little Trees Painter. So I'm really excited to bring this next one to you, and that is Julia Child remix. You may remember, if you're an older viewer here, you remember the PBS cooking show, you know, Cooking with Julia Child. Uh, she pretty much invented the genre of, of cooking show, of TV cooking show. She is the progenitor of that entire genre and uh, was a staple in American living rooms for years and years and years and pretty much just opened up the idea of French cuisine to American audiences. Now, what might this have to do with marijuana, you may ask? Well, 
I always think that cooking and marijuana kind of go together. You know, we we, we all love uh, eating, especially under the influence of cannabis. And some of the stuff that Julia Child would cook up mm, would be so delectable after a nice bowl. There was an interesting interview. I I put uh, marijuana and Julia Child into the Google to see what would come up. And there was an interesting interview with Julia Child that uh, briefly touched, you know, in passing on the subject. This was back when she was 82 years old. Back in 1997, Michael Howe interviewed her uh, for a cooking magazine. And uh, this was part of the interview. He asks, uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. Do you find food romantic? Julia Child. Yes, I think careful cooking is love, don't you? The loveliest thing you can cook for someone who's close to you is about as nice a Valentine as you can give. Then the question's asked, what is the connection between chocolate and romance, Mrs. Child? And Julia Child replies, chocolate? Well, I have heard that chocolate has some of the same elements that marijuana does. And marijuana presumably makes people happy. Chocolate certainly does. And I'll tell you what, you get some of those bang chocolates with the marijuana's mixed with the chocolate, it'll make you really happy. This is Julia Child from Melody Sheep with Julia Child Remixed on your Electric Tuesday Daily Toker Tunes. What makes a great chef? Well, training and technique, of course, plus a great love of food, a generous personality, and the ability to invent hot chocolate truffles meltingly addictive hot chocolate truffles balls of creamy chocolate filling that are rolled in fresh crumbs but send another piece as long as the dough is relaxed it's ready to roll ready to roll send another piece all in a ball ready to roll ready to roll freshness is essential that makes all the difference i like to smell something cookies This is what good cooking is all about. This is what good cooking is all about. I like sour cream cheese fillets, fillets, and the sweet topping, sweet topping, sweet topping. all on that crisp pastry. Ooh. You can't define these in a recipe. You can only know them. You can only know them. ginger in fish sauce. You need some fat in your diet or your body can't process your vitamins. Freshness is essential. That makes all the difference. All the difference. I like to smell something cooking. Makes me feel it. Bring on the roasted potatoes. Bring on the bullshit. This is what good cooking is all about. This is what good cooking is all about. Cook and cook and keep on cooking. This is the way to live. Cook and cook and keep on cooking. This is the way to eat. Bon appetit. The real test of a good chef is a perfectly roasted chicken. The lemons, the garlic, the rosemary. Butter free, butter free, rosemary, rosemary. Full, rich, creamy, suspended in its sauce. Beat it up a little bit, just to soften it. Fast and tough and rough. I'm just gonna show you how you do it. Beat it up a little bit, just to soften it. Chop it, hold it, roll it. Chop it, fast and tough and rough. Freshness is essential. That makes all the difference. All the difference. I like to smell something. Cookies. This is what good cooking is all about. This is what good cooking is all about. Cook and cook and keep on cooking. This is the way to live. Cook and cook and keep on cooking. Everyone gather around the dinner table. Cook and cook and keep on cooking. This is the way to live. Cook and cook and keep on cooking. This is the way to eat. Bon appetit.
Kids and marijuana, it's something every parent worries about. With Measure 80 on the ballot, many parents are worried about what message legalized marijuana would send to their children. While legalization seems scary, our experience with alcohol and tobacco show that regulation and education, not prohibition, are what best protects our children. Today, fewer teens drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes than when we were growing up. And that's because we passed strict ID carding regulations, put beer and cigarettes out of kids' reach, and educated them about the real harms of smoking and drinking. In fact, teen smoking and drinking are at their lowest recorded levels ever, and we didn't arrest a single adult for cigarettes and beer to accomplish that. Kids consistently say that beer is harder to buy than pot. After Measure 80, marijuana is treated like alcohol. You have to be 21, you have to show ID, and you have to go to an adults-only store. The message we send to kids today is just say no and it doesn't work. Let's send the message that marijuana is for adults and someday they can make that decision for themselves. Vote yes on Measure 8. Seventeen states and the District of Columbia have legalized the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. Over 70% of the American public supports the use of marijuana for medicinal purposes. What does Governor Mitt Romney think of medical marijuana? So medical marijuana is legal in Colorado. One of our viewers, Bill Ferguson, asked, should marijuana be legalized for medical use? Aren't there, issues, aren't there issues of significance that you'd like to talk about? The medicinal use of marijuana is a significant issue to the millions suffering from cancer, AIDS, and other chronic pain, nausea, spasticity, and seizure disorders. I, I think marijuana uh, should not be legal in this country. I believe it's a gateway drug to other uh, drug violations. The use of illegal drugs in this country is leading to terrible consequences in places like Mexico and actually in our own country. Okay. I, I, I oppose legalization of marijuana. Activism begins with ACT. The Rush Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. All right, welcome back, everybody. And joining us by telephone from our Across the Pond segment, we have got Clark French and Greg DeHope from Normal UK. Greg, how you doing? Can you hear us okay, Greg? Hmm, having some connection issues here. Hold on just a moment. Let's see if we can get that all fixed up. Make sure they can hear us out there. Greg, are you able to hear us now? There we go. Greg, can you hear us now? Normal UK. We're looking to speak with Normal UK. Still trying to get that connection all the way across the Atlantic. I can hear you, Ross. Can you hear me? There we go. We got you now. And uh, Clark French, are you on the line? Still missing Clark? Okay. Well, can we'll you go hear me, Ross? Uh, yep, yeah, I can hear you just fine. Getting in now. So uh, welcome back to the show. Glad to have you here. So, uh, Greg, starting off our, our segment today, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since we spoke to you. I wonder if you have any uh, news for us from uh, the UK, from Britain on uh, uh, the fight to end prohibition. All I got from that was prohibition. Ha still having trouble hearing? Okay, uh, Clark. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello there. Yeah, I was try trying to get the connection here. We're just... Uh, Wanting to find out what the latest news is from the UK. Um, well, I guess the latest news is that we start normal UK um, in the UK and kind of do something about it. I guess that's what I'm on doing. Um, I've just had a national TV appearance on Channel 4. It was only a section to share my story and just say a little bit about medical cannabis and doesn't work and i've got to say something about it. anyway i've got i've got a lot two minutes clark um, we're, we're having sorry. a little difficulty uh, uh with your connection there clark so i'm gonna uh, bring that down for a second and try to uh, redial you uh in the meantime we've got uh, greg de hope from normal uk as well on the line greg are you still able to hear us We're having all sorts of difficulties with our connection right now. So I'll tell you what, folks, we're going to uh, take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we hope to have that uh, connection up and working for you so we can uh, get a good interview with our guys across the pond. This is the way it goes sometimes. we got to fix a couple technical difficulties. We'll be right back after this.
We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. Okay, we're going to bring the line back up here. I think we've got Greg back on the line. Greg, can you hear us okay? I can hear you. How's it going? I switched to the iPhone now. Yeah, I don't know what was happening with that. We just uh, we installed a brand new feature on Skype, which was the group video call, and uh, apparently it's not working as I expected it to. But thanks for uh, sticking around with us and trying to make this work. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, – you I, you have a little bit of problems with Clark um, – explaining what we've got going on in the uk at the moment he's he's had a bit of a media coverage right uh, recently he's been in all sorts of newspapers in the reading area which is his uh which is his hometown of course he's started the uh berkshire cannabis community which um it's part of the uk csc united kingdom cannabis social clubs and that's been uh that's taken off really well it's been running about 10 months now and uh he's kind of leading the way down there in the south he's had three local meetings he's got a fourth one already organized and uh, he's the he's the South Regional Coordinator as well, so that's that's really good. I think we've got him back there. Yes, Clark, we got you yeah, on the back. line. How you I'm doing? Back. Thank you. I'm, I'm finding it difficult to hear us. I can hear Greg okay, but yeah, having a couple a couple of difficulties. I think uh, Greg's Skype needs to be upgraded. I got some sort of note that came up here with Skype to get this to work. But uh, we've got you on the line, and Greg was just informing us that you've been doing a lot of television appearances and, and media appearances. Tell us a little bit about it, and, and how did they go? Um, well, yeah, well, I mean, I guess um, I feel like I do quite a uh, story to get out there, like MS, and I do use cannabis medicinally, so like, it is one of the things where people, um, unfortunately, people, well, listen to, I just want to get out and a lot will listen to, well, someone who needs medicine, so I've kind of seen myself to try and get that out there a bit more, and kind of bring some more attention to the issue, because we're quite far behind in the UK, in comparison to the rest of Europe, and uh, we need to catch up, at least. So, just take people like me. Yeah, and, uh, it, it's going to take more people standing up for this in the UK. And like you mentioned, compared to the rest of Europe, uh, Greg once referred to you guys as the Texas of Europe, as far as the uh, prohibition type laws go there. And uh, last we much. last we spoke, there was some plan to bring in legal patients from Holland. Uh, is there any further movement on that? Actually, um, some issues with that because obviously special care tend to be fairly people, and unfortunately, they're going to, going to be doing that has been incredibly well. We're still still looking for someone that will happen. It's just a matter of finding someone else now. But we are we are still looking for that, and that is definitely going to happen. And that's something that we think is really powerful and really important to highlight. That, uh, Dutch patient with medicinal cannabis can bring it over to the UK and use it, but a British patient with the exact same condition would be, you know, put in prison basically for doing the thing. Yeah, it's, it seems absurd that you would have a, a situation like that where uh, two people could be standing side by side, one Dutch, one British, and when that joint goes from the Dutch hand to the British hand, it magically transmogrifies into a Class B drug. Ooh, scary. Yeah. Now, uh, it, it doesn't Greg, really make any sense whatsoever. Greg, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the the legal background on that. Why is it that uh, a Dutch patient could use medical marijuana in Britain? We have something called the Schengen Agreement in Europe. Uh, I think it used to actually be called the Amsterdam Treaty, but it got renamed when a few more um, a few more uh, member nations of uh, of the, uh, the European Union joined up from the rest of mainland Europe. When they actually signed up to, you know, to be part of this treaty and several others, don't ask me what they are. My European history isn't that good, uh, even though it's recent. <laughs> um, but uh, that that allows you to ha carry your psychotropic prescribed medicines to other st states that have signed the Schengen Agreement. Our government have actually turned around and say we don't agree with that part of the Schengen Agreement, which is it's Article. Um, I think I believe it's Article 75. Um, it literally says if you got, you're prescribed a psychotropic drug, you can take it to other countries that um, 
even if it's not prescribable there because, you know, that's the, the protection. Each country has got their right to their own government and their own home office and which prep medicines are prescribed or not through their own scientific procedures. Over here in the UK, we've got uh, procedures that are so rigorous they won't allow us to actually use cannabis as a medicine or allow doctors to even prescribe it. They've, that, they've had that ban since 1973. We've got the Misuse of Drugs Act in the UK, which governs our, our uh, prohibition. Yeah. Um, but we st we still can't have it as as a prescribed medicine. All cannabinoids are um, illegal to own or cultivate or or sell, despite the fact that they grow three hundred tons of it down in uh, Kent for, for GW Pharmaceuticals. Right, just like we have our U University of Mississippi pot farm as well here in the United States. Now, uh, Greg, on on this uh, this agreement and and the British government not agreeing with it, do they not agree with it in whole? I mean, are there any other psychotropic medications that might be coming in from other EU countries that they got a problem with it, or is it just cannabis? Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's it's just cannabis. But we've got a whole um, there's there are a lot of other issues involved in it as well. We have a, a social health care, and the cost is therefore paid by the taxpayer. And they've inflated the price of cannabis so over like a thousand percent of what it should actually be. You know, if you grew it uh, yourself at home. Um, so a bottle of Sativex, because they don't give it to you in herbal form if you are lucky enough to get a, a prescription for it. They give it to you in a bottle of Sativex, which is um, a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD. So if I've got, it's got 2.5 milligrams of THC and CBD in it. Uh, there's a little spray under the tongue in a, an alcohol tincture. It's not great for everyone. Uh, only 1,400 people get prescribed it in the UK. Um, most of them are MS. There's 100,000 people with MS in the country. The reason they allowed uh, the pharmaceutical companies to get hold of cannabis and make that is because MS patients were getting busted for growing it at home. So mm. it's uh, it, it's not working the way it should be. The government agree. If, you know, Clark's gone and met his MP. There's four or five MPs in the Berkshire area. He's trying to get them all down and, um, you know, one by one get them to agree that we need to get this available to patients as a matter of urgency. Um, but it's... Uh, it's, it, it, I think that one of them was actually uh, the um, was she the Home Secretary Clark Theresa May. She, she wasn't very. But she uh, started the government rhetoric about how cannabis is dangerous and all that crap. So, so she wouldn't listen. I mean, and what listen on uh, operational, but he is much of medical and agrees a doctor should be able to describe it. And you also know, in one of my recent articles. Um, saying that uh, one of the problems about it is that um, it's associated with smoking, but nowadays people can vaporise. So my MP knows about vaporising, which I was pretty impressed about. Hmm. Yeah, so they, they do know more than they are letting on. Oh, that, that's amazing. So when you go in and, and talk to your member of parliament like that, uh, Clark, uh, have you found that one particular you know, that there's a particular way that they start to listen to the argument. I mean, here in America, it seems like, you know, we tell them, oh, it's wrong to lock people up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, people need medicine. Yeah, yeah. Hey, this is costing a lot of money. What? They're all they're all perking up to the money argument. Is that the same thing in, in, in the UK? Uh, I think to some extent, my idea actually was more interested in my kind of personal story and like my, you know, how I found it completely amazing and bad. He believes that I, you know, could have a better quality of life. So I think the kind of angle that he went for is something that we do need to do in the UK a lot, especially if we do have a conservative government at the moment. And, you know, conservatives are all about the money. So mm -hmm. we need to show that it is economic. Good point. We uh, can't make a lot of money in regulation. Yeah, Greg, Greg, we've talked about that before as well, uh, how uh, you're now in the throes of a conservative government there. And, you know, just in the past, you know, what, six or seven years, you've gone from being class C drug to being re-upgraded to class B drug and a lot of hysteria about that. What are the political prospects for some of the other parties, some of the other coalitions out there that might be more supportive of our measure? Well, we've we've got over here. We've actually got a coalition government, which is uh, the con main majority is conservative. We've got uh, David Cameron sitting on his uh, artificial throne, kind of thing, and uh, is um, as the jokers joke about it. Uh, the, sorry, the papers they joke about him. Uh, Nick Clegg is uh, is deputy prime minister, which is the head of the Liberal Democrat Party, um, is being his like wife, because <laughs> uh, obviously it's ten Downing Street, isn't it? They've got to share a bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's only small in England. You've got to cram everyone in. There's 60 million of us over here. <laughs> um, 
um, but uh, th- we've got the Green Party. We've got one MP uh, in Brighton, Sarah. Lu- uh, sorry, um, Caroline Lucas. Caroline Lucas. I was going to say Sarah Martin. Then uh, Caroline Lucas. Thanks, Clark. Um, she's sort of like um, anti-prohibition. They've got a, a, quite a, a hard drug use uh, rate down, a high hard drug use rate now, and they're a lot of injecting um, um, users. And they have needle exchange programs, and that is shown to be practical. They're reducing HIV, uh, other um, needle exchange, uh, transmitted diseases, and uh, like hepatitis, and um, just helping people actually, you know, in in society integrate a little bit better hold down get back into work maybe or find somewhere to live they actually care about the you know the the people behind it it's not they're not just a statistic a drug user that you know is a problem they are a person that person needs a bit of help we're here to give it to them you know we are a society that cares about people well we should be anyway Mm -hmm. um we want to see a bit more of that model around one of the green party councillors in brighton actually um said that we should look towards a cannabis um coffee shop or cannabis social club model for the uk it's practical we've you know there's already quite a bit of tourism down on the the south coast there not too dissimilar from the uh, from you know amsterdam so well that it could be that atmosphere anyway Hmm. it'd be great to get that change you know 16 million people in the uk uh could benefit from this even if they don't use cannabis they can benefit from the economics of it benefit from the freeing up of uh, police law enforcement resources and so forth let me turn to clark here one more time because i just saw you on the video i noticed you puffing up a a cone there and i'm just wondering as a patient there how difficult is it for you to come by your medicine horrible it's in the Lengths I have to go to, like I, I mentioned that in my fourth floor appearance, actually on TV, that I have to basically go to the gangs and hit the market. I have to, you know, if it's a, if it's a choice between me having really bad, get my medicine from someone I pick money, I'm for the better quality of life. You know, you know, I don't want to get my money, but I'm forced to. Yeah. Sort of situation. You know, I, I have been. I have experienced the dispensary. It's so much more than we are here, and it kind of it's life changing for people. With it. And, and the the we don't I don't get of my medicine. You know, in it's a tea ridge. This is what it is. You know, here it is in a bag. You know, what's it called? Something like, often is not even a strain name or whatever. And I'm, I'm lucky that sometimes some people help me out with me care packages. And stuff, but you know, it's a good situation to be in, and it causes a lot of stress. Causing me a lot about you know, am I have enough medicine to be well? You know, what if I take a turn? I need more of this. I can't. Thing. And it's, you know, it's unfair. Like, I have time to yeah, Clark, I, I'm sorry, man. We're having such a difficulty uh, on connection right now that I'm just going to I have to drop that line. And, uh, Greg, I want to thank you guys for uh, joining us here. And Normal we'll have better uh, better connection next time that we pull this stuff off. But uh, thanks for joining us on the uh, Across the Pond segment. And we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. No worries. Thanks for having us on, Russ. Uh, and, uh, yeah, hopefully Clark will, I think you probably wanted to say, he wants to get back out there again at some point next year. So uh, it'll, hopefully he'll be able to hook up with you at one point. Yeah, we'll get it all figured out, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're doing it live, and uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks across the pond. We'll see you then. Thanks very much, Russ. Oh, Peace thanks. out. Bye. See you later, guys. See all you right. Good go. When we come back, we're going to have a little bit of time here to do a radical rant and to take a look at the states of Michigan and Connecticut and how the efforts there to stop healthy people from using cannabis is causing sick people a lot of problems in getting their medical cannabis. All that and more coming we'll up on right the Rust Belt Show. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks may be far less than those posed by legal drugs. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. 
For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Brand. Welcome back, everybody. It is 40. That's 50 after the hour now. Welcome to the show and uh, time for a little bit of radical rant here. A couple of stories that came across the desk today that just highlighted the idiocy of trying to separate sick from healthy when it comes to whether or not they should be allowed to use marijuana without being put in a cage. I told you earlier about the Connecticut Medical Marijuana Act going into effect on Monday, October 1st. And unfortunately, well, I mean, fortunately, it's good that it went into effect and we want to protect patients who possess cannabis, but they have nowhere to get it. They're saying not until sometime next year are they going to be able to put forth the dispensaries that the people need there in Connecticut. Again, people in Connecticut, the patients there are not going to be able to grow their own because as is the standard on the East Coast, it seems to try to prevent the abuse Oh, no, somebody might get marijuana that doesn't really deserve it. They're not really sick. In order to prevent that abuse, they do not let patients grow for themselves and force them to have to buy marijuana through dispensaries. Marijuana, which will cost much more for the patients than it would if they were able to produce it themselves or have a caregiver produce it for them. And the quote that comes back in this that always just rings every time we get into one of these discussions on the East Coast comes from William Rubenstein from the State Department of Consumer Protection, who says, quote, no one wants us to be like California, end quote. Now, that's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, you can look at California's Prop 215 passing and instituting the medical marijuana era, but by instituting the medical marijuana era in the way that it did, did it lock us into a situation where medical marijuana can only get more and more restrictive? In the Connecticut program, they already took out chronic pain, severe pain, or intractable pain, because it's been, it's kind of grown into this uh, meme that part of the abuse of medical marijuana is people faking pain. Uh, one of the stories I was reading is people uh, using uh, non-objectively uh, discoverable ailments like migraines or chronic pain, right? Now, my wife suffers from migraines. She uses medical marijuana for her migraines. And uh, trust me, you can't fake a migraine. <laughs> it's really hard to fake constant puking uh, because of the migraine, right? But... Anyway, and it's really frustrating, too, because this is only done in the name of trying to keep the medical program medical. Let's make sure it's only medical, only the sick people. we got to do everything we can to keep the healthy people out, everything we can. And by doing that, we deny the very medical science that backs up the use of marijuana for chronic pain. We have more studies that show the use of marijuana for chronic pain than any other condition that we list it for. There's better, there's better evidence of marijuana helping pain than marijuana helping glaucoma. Okay, so this is something that, of course, is overlooked. And the fact is, in the state of Connecticut itself, they've got an entire web page from their Department of Public Health, you know, the people that should cover a health program. The Department of Public Health has a page up for chronic pain where it estimates 30% of people in the state of Connecticut suffer from chronic pain, 30%. Now, Connecticut is a state of about three and a half million people. So what, 30% of that is uh, 300,000, something like that, 900,000, a lot of people, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. I can't do the math in my head today. And not only that, you got to jump through all those hoops. You also got to get your physician to register you in the state of Connecticut online. And your physician gets to decide whether or not you get to have a caregiver. And so everything we do trying to restrict medical marijuana, all it does is hurt the people that could really use medical marijuana. It's, it's ridiculous in that the, the medical marijuana acts here do not in any way prevent healthy people from getting the marijuana they've always gotten. Every attempt they make to try to keep healthy people out of a medical marijuana program only hurts the people who really use the program legitimately. 
Here in Oregon, they decided that 50,000 patients were too many patients. So we're going to raise the fee. We're going to raise this fee from $100 to $200. Because if you're sick, you should have to really prove it by putting an enormous investment in it. Poor people don't get that sick, right? If you, and it completely goes against what their intent was. If the intent was to keep healthy people who are faking it out of the medical marijuana program so they can just get their get out of jail free card, then the opposite effect. If you're a guy who's smoking pot recreationally and used to spending 300 bucks an ounce or so, going from 100 bucks a year to 200 bucks a year to keep your ass out of jail is no big deal. You're a healthy person. You can work. You've got a job. You can afford that extra raise in fee. They could raise the fee to a thousand bucks and it still might be worth it for you. And it's especially counterproductive when you consider what they consider to be abuse is people using the medical marijuana law as a shield to grow a whole bunch of plants and sell it out of state, you know, and you know, sell it uh, on the black market. Well, again, if you're a guy growing a whole bunch of weed card stacking from a whole bunch of patients, you're making such buku profit. They could raise that card to $10,000 a year and it would be fine for you to pay it. You would be fine with it because it would be just the cost of doing business. But meanwhile, you're one of those sick people that the medical marijuana law was made for. One of those undeniably documented sick people that even the most hardcore opponent would have to admit, all right, well, they're pretty sick. They could, they could smoke some pot, I suppose. That guy, that's the one who gets hurt. That's the guy who just saw his low income fee go from 20 bucks to 100 bucks. And then only if he's on SSI, used to be SSI food stamps and uh, Oregon Health Plan would get you that 20 bucks. Now only SSI gets you that 100 buck fee. So a lot of people who were on food stamps, who were paying 20 bucks a year for their medical marijuana card, now have to pay 200 because they don't qualify for the low cost 100 one under food stamps. Raising the fee for medical marijuana for poor people on food stamps by a factor of 10. So what you're going to get, and they're already seeing it, is the, the roles, the people in, uh, that are signing up for the medical marijuana program to pay their protection money are starting to drop. Well, congratulations. You got less abuse, right? Wrong. Because the people dropping off those roles are the poor people, the really sick people who have to make their choices between medicine and rent and groceries and gas. Not the guy who's dealing on the side who's got money flowing out of his ears. Not the recreational smoker who'll do anything he can to stay out of jail. The sick people are the ones dropping out of the roles. So, ironically enough, in combating this abuse, all you've done is make the ratio of people abusing the program greater. There will now be fewer patients who really do deserve to be in the program qualifying. Of course, it's probably their intent, right? Make the program look worse. Make it look like there's even more abuse than what's really going on. Weed out all those healthy people or all those sick people who make for such compelling stories on the nightly news, right? And in Michigan, a similar thing going on with their medical marijuana program, trying to restrict it in order to make sure that the healthy people can't get involved. In this situation, the Michigan medical, uh, medical marijuana program and the Michigan uh, uh, Board of Health are investigating doctors who make recommendations for cannabis, uh, alleging that they're, you know, all sorts of wrongdoing and they're not following proper procedures and they're not, you know, seeing the patients for the right amount of time, yada, yada, yada. Yet in years of of medicine prescribing going on there in Michigan. Rarely do we see any cases where doctors are given the same sort of scrutiny over their prescription of Vicodin, Percocet, Xanax, Darvocet, Ambien. Why must we have so much scrutiny over the prescription of, or the recommendation of marijuana compared to the prescription of all these other drugs? Well, once again, because we got to keep the marijuana out of the healthy people's hands. There must be some abuse going on. Oh, it's so frustrating. Of course, the ultimate solution to the abuse of any medical marijuana program is legalization of marijuana for the healthy people. It is untenable to have a black market and a gray market running side by side without the gray market getting a whole lot darker.
Let's fix this. Let's legalize in 2012. Amendment 64, I-502, Measure 80. I'm Radical Russ for Brian the Red and Wiz Calico and Cannabis Carry. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. Oops. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down to earth.